Take a breath. Take a deep breath. This is our our a mantra. Big noisy one. In I hate the that we gasp. gasp. A lot in the, but that's just the noise. <laughs> we're just noisy people. We just have very frightening tales to tell you that we're always <gasps> gasping for <gasps> air. It's <gasps> shocking. It's shocking. Just like the beginning of this podcast. It's creatures of the night. <gasps> Those are scary things. <laughs> so scary. Because you're Wendy and I'm Chris. <laughs> <laughs> How you like that for an intro? Now, if we would record that Ooh. and just play it every time. Every time you like it that much, I can do that magical editing. I can make a clip of it. Put some creepy, <laughs> um, you know, like Halloween music back to it. Yeah. Halloween is right around the corner. I don't know if you saw, I got something new to decorate my background with. Did you see this? I time? noticed that. Yes. And I was trying to cute? ask myself, has it been there the whole time? No. And I put your <laughs> candles up here too. The Creatures of the Night paranormal candles that Wendy made for our site. They're burning behind me so that I can be enlightened. And honestly, I'm not going to play, but, and I, I'm kind of in like an enclosed area with these candles. My sinuses have been feeling pretty nice tonight. So apparently they're moisturizing the, uh, the breathing <laughs> holes. Your nostrils. <laughs> so if you suffer from allergies or from paranormal things that you don't want around you, burn a couple of these bad boys. I think it'll help. They're quite beautiful. I am very proud of my work. I had to get glass in my fingers for <gasps> it. So. Ooh, did you? Did you ever get the glass out? Yeah, I did. It was just stupid. It was stupid the way that I was cleaning them. I I will try. I try a different method now, and it's not as bad. Very few shards, but oh. before I was just like a dummy. Let's put. Let's put 10 bottles of, you know, cut glass in a bathtub and not have shards of glass left behind. <laughs> How does that happen, Wendy? It doesn't. I'm a oh. dummy. But a few, a few scrubs in the tub. Not me in the tub, but me scrubbing the tub. <laughs> me in the tub with my empty <laughs> wine bottles. It's all, it's all, we've got a better process now. Mm. When I was trying to, um, which I failed at epically, save my wine bottles so that I could make the candles, uh, <laughs> the whole thing sucked for me. I, I didn't have a good experience. Um, I was able to clean cut the bottles, but I couldn't like sand them down so that they'd be smooth. You know, they would be that, uh, you know, if you touch it, you might cut yourself face. So I knew that I couldn't like give that to anybody for any reason. No, it's very, it's pretty like, it's dangerous what you're yeah. dealing with, man. I mean, dangerous in the sense like you're not, you can't, you got to make it right. Yeah. Because you can't send out something that's going to put hurt glass somebody. In people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of sanding it like a, a crazy person and then having to test it yourself. And then say, so okay, yeah. there's glass in my skin now. Not right. quite ready. <laughs> I never made it that far. And I never even had like the high power sander. I just had like the one that you use with your hand. And that's where I failed. I just have to stick with what I know. And that is paint and wood. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're very good at it. Thank you. And just so you know that I don't have a, I do have high powered sanders, but I did not use them on oh, these you glass didn't? jars. So these right here, these Whoa, guns, those muscles, yeah. Those were the high powered sanders. No, I just you lay a sheet down and if you wet it enough and you just do a lot of circles and that's your exercise for the day. That's your yeah. upper body exercise for the day. Nice. That's why I only make like five of them at a time. <laughs> <laughs> and done. No, you can't even hold your wine glass. Did you, you had to put the straw in it at that point because you're like, I can't, I can't. My arms are just rubber at this point. Well, you know, now we're on <laughs> fucking diets, which are horrible, like just stupid. Yeah. So wine's not a part of the equation anymore. No. So that's a bummer. Apparently they don't do candles out of um, truly hard seltzer cans. No, and they should. <laughs> they should <laughs> never, ever. I'm, I appreciate this company for giving us something to drink while we're on a diet. Mm -hmm. If that, if we didn't have this, we'd have to be actually just taking fucking shots of, you know, Ooh. vodka and whiskey or tequila or whatever. And this podcast would not happen. <laughs> Why? You think after a couple of shots, you're done? Mm, I'm done after I dance and take some clothes off. <laughs> <laughs> after the images that you sent me loud. today, I'm never dancing again, <laughs> ever. Nope. That's what I look like. Yep. <laughs> uh, then I'm like, well, I got to go to bed. And then I'm like, whoo, this bed won't stop moving. That's won't, crazy. Yeah. Whoa, I'm like, if I go puke, spinning. I'll be better. <laughs> uh. 
It doesn't work for me. Oh, you're not doing it right then. <laughs> yeah, no, my stomach doesn't allow me to do anything right. What an asshole. I know it is. <laughs> <laughs> so the other day I had made plans. Well, just yesterday, I had made plans to tour this old haunted ranch that's only about an mm. hour from my house, and I've never made it out there. I saw that they were doing paranormal investigations out at it, but it was already sold out or whatever, and I couldn't buy a ticket. Plus, I'm like an right. old lady, and I don't like to leave my house sometimes. So I'm like, eh. I'll make plans to go out there and do a day tour, scope it out for myself. See oh. if the next time that rolls around, I'll buy a ticket, you know, in a timely manner and all that bullshit. So, yeah. but before I could go out to this ranch for the day, I had to run some errands. So I had to go to like Target and the grocery store. Halfway through my fucking errands, I'm like, fuck that ranch. I'm not <laughs> going to make it out there. I mean, it's still just too hot right now to be making plans uh, like that. I was like sweating through my fucking clothes. I'm yeah. like getting sweat stains like on my gut area, you know, <laughs> it's like, <ugh. laughs> like the, the fisherman sweat well, stains. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, mm -hmm. My clothes are ruined now. I can't quite oh. go prance around this historic ranch and be like, oh, I'm Wendy from <laughs> Creatures of the Here's Night <laughs> with my, my sweat stains. Visit me. I have a podcast. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to, you know, investigate your location sometime. I'm very professional in my sweaty ass clothes. So I scrapped that idea and I they were having a stars party down at my neighborhood park. It's like one of those events where people bring out their like fancy telescopes oh. and there's somebody down there that knows what they're talking about. And they point out like constellations and planets to you and stuff. So I thought we'll do that instead because the sun will have set by right. then. The murderous evil sun will have been gone. And so it'll be a lot nicer outside. And that'll be our outing for the day. Nope. <laughs> Fucking rains. As soon as it gets dark, there, I hear the thunder and then they're like, there's, it's lightning outside. I'm like, mother fuck. So whole day, no plans. Like all the plans got ruined by mother nature. Mother nature. <laughs> Strikes again. So bitch. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so I had no choice but to stay in, have some adult beverages. Oh. And watch The Haunting of Hill House on Netflix. Uh, it, actually, I have to say, it's pretty good. And you know, I don't watch horror films. So for me to say that, it means a lot. But like, there's also moments within the, sh the show that crazy shit's happening. And I know it's a fictional story. But I find myself like yelling at the TV screen, like, just move out of the fucking house. What is wrong with you? Why are you tolerating That's this so bullshit? See, good for you. You're doing that in your home. I do that at the movie theater. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why I can't go and watch horror films in a movie theater. It's just crazy the shit that happens. And these people are just like brushing their teeth and going back to bed afterwards. And it's like, mm -mm. I would be like, nope. You nope. can count me out. I am done with this shit. Yeah, like at Pep Cemetery. They're just like, oh, okay, that was weird. That cat should be dead. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, and I grew up in a haunted house. I had a ghost that appeared to me. I He was bugging me all the time. But he didn't do the kind of shit that's going on at the Hill House, you know, on that show. Had he? I would have slept in the family car like every fucking night. I would have had to like 12 years old packing my bag and been like, I got to move out. Sorry. By the time we had actually done Velisca and we slept in the car, you'd be like, no, 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 this is, this is totally usual for me. I'm fine with just You're cuddling up here. in this car. That's good. Get out. I know. <laughs> it's just such a fine line of desire for us. I think we want, we would love to own, like freaking love to own a haunted location, place, house, whatever. But to actually have to sleep there every night, shower there, do your normal like daily stuff there while these like random acts of wild paranormal activities happening. Oh, yeah. It's like, how the fuck do you function that way? Well, so that's the thing. I mean, I haven't seen this yet, though I am off tomorrow, so I might 
actually watch it. But the thing is, is places can be haunted and not terrifyingly haunted. You can have some shit going on like I have here and the ghost is kind of like, yeah, 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 I did my thing for the month. <laughs> I'm going back to disappear for a while. You know, they're just not energetic. Or you burn a bunch of sage and incense and do a bunch of prayers and they just disappear. I, I really don't know. But then you have those other places, I guess, you know, um, Ashmore, Edinburgh, uh, those places that constantly have. Valiska. Uh, <laughs> Valiska. Like, don't you? I, it just rolls off my tongue like the most horrifying <laughs> place on earth. <laughs> But, you know, it, it's not like you're not living in those types of situations, at least for the guy at Velisca or the gal, whoever owns Velisca, they don't sleep there. They just own right. it and they can go and visit it and then they can go away. Yes. They can. OK, cool. Yes. That's the kind of yeah. lifestyle that I desire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think that, it, you know, if I was waking up every night and seeing some whole you know, horribly scary figure watching me sleep or something or hearing it prance through my house and it's terrifying looking. I just, I would not be able to do that. You don't think you get used to it. You'd be like, damn, quit waking me up. No. Cause what when was... it did happen to me when I was a kid, I was like, could you please stop it? Yeah, and it didn't yeah. even look that horrible. It was a shadow figure and it was a mist figure. The stuff that they're seeing in this movie. And like I said, it's a fictional story and it's, it's all fictional. It's not real, but I can't imagine if people actually saw these kind of things and then yeah. they just went on with their regular lives. <laughs> I know TV's incredible, isn't it? But some people claim to actually live like this. Remember this yeah. was a while ago. I told you on BuzzFeed Unsolved, they were investigating a chick that a works in California, yeah, right? A chick that works for them at BuzzFeed. And she said what she described, it looked like the chick from the ring, you know, and her kid had seen it too. And they're just like, yeah. we just want to know if it's bad or good, you know, since we're not moving and we're still just brushing our teeth and going to bed and living here. Yeah. Well, if nothing bad has happened to them yet, I mean, why would they have a reason to fear it other than the fact that she looks like the chick from the <laughs> ring, Samara, 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 that's her name. Oh, I just name dropped that shit. <laughs> yeah. Well, I couldn't remember which Ghostbusters the people from the Titanic had rolled up in, but I just name dropped her. Okay. So anyways, I don't remember in the, the woman from Buzzfeed, if bad things were happening, I remember them hearing a lot of weird footsteps in like the attic maybe, and them seeing something that was creepy. Right. But was anything bad happening? No, they said they didn't even feel threatened. And I know you can, I mean, we, from experience, you've heard paranormal activity happening and then you some place that we've been to, Velisca, ha, you could feel that bad vibe. And then other places, you know, like the James Eldridge house, you you didn't feel that. Well, actually, I did feel that vibe. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. And then, and yes, that spot, it came up yes, on you. Yes. So yeah. that was a bad example. Sedumsville, we didn't feel anything until that exact moment. Right. So then again, it, it, can, it can come and go, too. Yeah. And even that didn't 100% percent feel evil or bad you know it just felt like a presence that was there so I mean I guess that's the thing is that they they see this person this girl this child and it doesn't it might look dark and everything but it doesn't give off that vibe necessarily and so they feel comfortable with it I don't know. The spirit that I saw in the house that I grew up in, it wasn't a complete form. You know, it was a, a silhouette of a man. And then the yeah. other thing, it was just a cloud of a mist, kind of like our samurai ghost. You know, that's all it really looked like. It didn't have even as much shape as the the dark silhouette did year a couple of years before that. And that's it. Mm. I mean, I felt his presence. It didn't always feel that great. Do you think it was the same? The same person? Yeah, the same entity, the, the mist and the shadow? I wondered about that because in all our paranormal research, a lot of the times you hear it's one or the other. They're appearing one way or the other. But because of that experience, it leads me to believe it's possible for them to appear in different forms because he, I'm going to say he, cause it gave off a very male vibe. Um, he appeared in the same place 
Like he was always appearing in that same threshold in the home. Yeah. And it just, I never felt a different presence. It was always this male presence, just really like always just kind of hovering the fuck over me, you know? Oh, you know what? Uh, sorry to sidebar, but the uh, my favorite murderer, they do the uh, hometowns. It was the haunted one, I'm sure. Um, there was this one lady had, that had wrote in and said that there was a, a like a ghostly presence, uh, like of a man who had pointed out an area of the home, and they pulled up the boards, and that's where all the money had been buried or whatever, oh and his my jars. God, don't say that to me. Uh, maybe that's what was happening in your house. <laughs> he was in that Shit. area because that's where the money was. <laughs> Go back. <laughs> Damn. We'll definitely have to go back. Maybe that's when I I wrote to the family that lives there now, and they did not reply back to me because they're probably like, bitch, and they're like, you know, hitting the money like you do in the strip club. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work well in a podcast to show you what I'm doing, but you know what I mean. When you got that cash, that, that wad of dollar bills, and you just sliding them out, that's how they're doing partying in my house, taking my money. <laughs> I, Your money. I spent time. With, no, I was a bitch to that ghost. I was like, leave me that fuck alone. Well, he just appeared to somebody else and they're like, hmm, what does this guy mean? <laughs> Damn. Can't believe I missed out on that. And speaking of living in haunted places, my story this week just so happens to be about a haunted apartment building. Ooh. However, it is not just any old plain apartment building that happens to have ghosts just running around it. Of course not. I wouldn't do that to you. Dun, dun, dun. It is one of Manhattan's most infamous buildings. Oh, Manhattan. Manhattan. That's right. This building is not a landmark because of its height or grandeur, though. It's because of the darkness that has surrounded it over the years. Creepy. The Dakota was constructed between October 25th of 1880 and October 27th of 1884 by owner Edward Cabot Clark, head of the Singer Manufacturing Company. You know the sewing machine? Yes! I know I had one! I I think I have one that I never use. (laughs) I can't wait for a yard sale to get rid of (laughs) that. I was like, well, this is a mistake. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Get that piece of junk out of here. I would have used it, but um, apparently the one that I had, you had to get tuned. And I got it. I couldn't wait because I love to sew. I love to make like clothes and, and costumes and stuff. My mom refused to get it tuned. She told me to look into it. Okay, because I had internet, you know, back then. Nope. <laughs> and I worked at Party City. So I'm like, uh, do you know who tunes? Uh, <laughs> no. Okay. Friend, other friend, do you know who tunes? No, I couldn't. No. Why would any of us know that fucking shit? So I sewed my costumes with this non-tuned um, sewing machine. And they were they were kind of busted sewing jobs. So I assumed it was always because I didn't get it tuned. It could have been because it was a second-hand sewing machine that was also haunted. <laughs> <laughs> And that's why my mom was like, "Mm -mm, we ain't taking that nowhere. Or it's stolen. Mm -hmm. Stolen and haunted. Yeah, one or the other. Well, they make liquid stitch now, so you don't need that fucking sewing machine. That's where I am, Just super glue that bitch. Easy. (laughs) Um, The building was named the Dakota because at the time, this area of Manhattan was sparsely inhabited and considered remote. So it was kind of a running joke that Clark had built so far away from everything that it was like being in the Dakotas. Okay. Though it is definitely thunderstorming outside. I heard that. Yeah. I thought maybe that was like a jet. No, I just saw the lightning a second ago, too. So oh. this is kind of fun. We don't even have to Ooh. enter in our own uh, sound effects. It's just right. going to be natural. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Though today the area is called the Upper West Side. So it is far from being sparsely inhabited these days. The Dakota earned its reputation for a few dark reasons, but most notably is that it is the location of John Lennon's murder. Am I going to have to talk over the thunder? Yes! This is serious thunder. Calm the fuck down. This is going to be the scariest podcast to date. Ever. (laughs) (laughs) So, this is sad, though. Let's get serious. Okay. Try to. Try to get serious with me, Thunderstorm. On the evening of December 8th, 1980, English musician John Lennon, formerly of the Beatles, was fatally shot in the archway of his home, the Dakota. For those of you who don't know the story, 
The perpetrator was a giant waste of fucking space named Mark David Chapman. <laughs> Chapman <laughs> does not like that so I much. Know. I know. I'm angry too about it. Right. Chapman planned the killing over the course of several months. And on that fateful morning began waiting for Lennon outside his home at the Dakota. During the evening, he finally met Lennon, who wow. signed a copy of his just released album, Double Fantasy. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, this fucking asshole got an autograph from the man that he was planning on killing that very day. Isn't that sort of like the um, the mindset of the, like they like to get in their heads? He he wants to go and meet him. And then they like, you know, because then after they murder him, then they return to the scene of the crime dressed all like unsuspecting. Like it's all about that. Not playing it's like God, a trophy but, for them. Which yeah, it, it's. Being in this, control. I've got the signature from my victim, you right. know, or whatever. He I had no really idea what know. I was going to do. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really know what his fucking motive was behind this because I'm not a psychologist or an FBI agent or anything like that. But it's just fucked to me because yeah. I, I didn't, I, you know, I'm aware of who killed him and kind of his reasonings why, but I never knew that before researching this story that he got a fucking autograph from him. And That's I'm like, crazy. what up? Fucking dick. Yeah. So Lennon left with his wife, Yoko Ono, for a recording session at Record Planet Studio. Later that night, the Lennons returned. That's weird to say the Lennons, but <laughs> <laughs> that's their name. They returned home, and as they walked towards the entrance of the building, Chapman fired five hollow point bullets from a thirty eight special revolver, four of which hit Lennon in the back. Damn, and the thunder is going perfectly with your story. I hope so. I yes. hope it's not. I hope I'm louder than the <laughs> <laughs> So Chapman, a total fucking weirdo, remained at the scene reading from J.D. Salinger's novel, The Catcher in the Rye, until the police arrested him. Yes, he was <gasps> obsessed with that fucking book. He was obsessed with the Beatles as well, yeah. or John Lennon. Either or. I think the Beatles is what it said when I read huh. a little bit more about him. But he's a dickhead, so I don't want to talk too much about him. Yep. Just know that he claimed the reason that he killed Lennon was that he was enraged by his lifestyle and public statements, especially his much publicized remark about the Beatles being more popular than Jesus. Which, oh. I mean, kind of had a point. I mean, like, there's, there's a lot of religions in the world, but there's mm -hmm. only one irreplaceable band called the Beatles. They were they were international. Yeah, but man, when you go messing around with religion, that's when people go fucking psycho. I mean, maybe he said that if he said we're more popular than God, I mean, like that would include all the Jewish population as well, and so maybe that would have been a bit much. But I think he said Jesus. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> so sadly. Lennon was rushed in a police cruiser to Roosevelt Hospital, where he was pronounced dead on arrival. For this very reason and a few others, the building is believed to be cursed as well as haunted. Yeah. The first reported sighting of Lennon's ghost was in... Hold for thunder. <laughs> You know, it doesn't rain in Arizona too often, so this is insane that this is happening. I know. I was just sitting there thinking, oh, my God, it is so loud. But you are in a desert. It's not like you have a bunch of other trees and stuff around you, I no. guess, to dampen the noise at all. Mm -mm. So it's just like, ba-boom. And then it's like, ba-boom, ba-boom, ba And I'm, I'm also right by a window, guys, and I cannot move. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I have nowhere to go in this house. Uh, so, yeah, we're just going to listen to the sounds of rain together. You know, if you need to take a nap, this is fine. As long as you finish the podcast and at the end you leave a review saying it was fantastic. <laughs> it was fantastic. You had the best nap of your life. Thank you. <laughs> so the first reported sighting of Lennon's ghost was in 1983 when Joey Harrow, a musician, and Amanda Moore's spotted the Beatles standing at the entrance of the Dakota, where he was murdered. He saw all of the Beatles standing there? Oh, shit. No, <laughs> the Beatles. Oh, okay. <laughs> if I said Beatles, I meant the Beatle, John. Okay. Yeah, I was like, it. damn, that's crazy. That okay. would be really cool. <laughs> no, it's like, how did that and even And also, like, happen? wait, they're not all, okay, straight. Right. <laughs> it's a hallucination is all that is. Yeah, but. all right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah the 80s 
<laughs> Joey claimed that Lennon was surrounded by an ominous light. And Amanda said that she almost approached Lennon, but he had an upsetting look on his face. So she oh. resisted. And then he just dissipated and disappeared. Weird. Lennon's widow, Yoko Ono, has publicly stated that she witnessed her husband's ghost in their apartment. Yoko lived at the Dakota for another 20 years after his death. She says that she saw the spirit of John sitting at his piano within their apartment, and he turned to her and said, don't be afraid. I am still with you before Aww. vanishing. I know. What a sweet message. Before what? I missed that. Oh, before vanishing. Thunder. That's oh. rude. You're interrupting. I know. He vanished afterwards. That's really sweet, What if though? nobody else can hear the thunder and we just, I just sound insane saying those things. <laughs> <laughs> so, oddly... In 1966, according to his first wife, John Lennon's first wife, Cynthia, he had received letters from a psychic warning him that he would be shot whilst living in the United States. From that time onward, he had developed an interest in spiritualism and attended numerous seances. It is rumored that during one of those seances, the spirit of his manager, Brian Epstein, warned him that he would be shot and to what? take care. How did the fucking manager know that? Yeah, right? Can go <laughs> to the future? Was the manager a psychic too, or did he talk to the psychic? That's really crazy. That is strange, though, to think, like, why do they have inside information of what will happen? I mean, were people just buying guns and all, like, registering them under John Lennon's name or something? Like, that's well, weird. You don't know the timeline of when he might have had this seance and this manager gave him this information. Yeah. So, oh, right, right. Well, it did only say that the murderer, uh, Chapman, had planned it for only months. But he had been obsessed with the Beatles themselves for a long time. So I don't know. Maybe the manager's ghost woo, floating around Ooh. everywhere and he happened to see a threatening individual. Maybe there were more threatening individuals, not just this one. Sure. There's a lot of conspiracies about that, right? Yeah. I well, I mean, I mean, I do not dive into any of them, though. <laughs> he is a famous person. And with fame comes a lot of that bullshit that someone right. has to deal with. Yeah. In 1969, while holidaying in Greece, Lennon was warned by an astrologer that he would be killed on an island. Believing the message huh. was referring to a Greek island, the musician right. returned home. Uh, Years after his death, Yoko Ono realized that the astrologer must have been referring to the island of Manhattan. Yep. Despite the warnings from psychics, astrologers, mystics, and his own sense that he would die young, he could do nothing to avoid what ultimately was his fate. But even before his death, John Lennon had claimed to have his own paranormal experience at the Dakota. Lennon told tales of seeing a spirit he called the crying lady walking oh. the halls of the building. Lennon wasn't the only person to see the crying lady either, as she is one of the Dakota's most popular ghosts. Ooh. Those who have seen her believe she is the ghost of Elise Veasley, who managed the Dakota from the 1930s to the 1950s. Elise, who was said to be way into the paranormal herself and believed that she had psychokinetic powers, meaning, as you know from your recent story, that she believed she could move objects with her mind. But she had control over them. Well, I don't know if she knew that she had control, but she, oh. she, she, she bragged about having this power because oh. Elise once was approached by a resident who had returned from a trip to find his furniture rearranged in his apartment. And Whoa. she, she states that she had not physically entered the apartment, but maybe she moved the furniture with her mind from her office. Maybe. <laughs> Which is crazy. <laughs> That's the kind of shit she told people. So, I mean, Elise sounds super fucking fun, and I adore her. She's like the kind of person who you want as, you know, on your side. So when shit gets crazy, she'll be like, mm, I might have done that with my mind. Sorry. Mess with us again. <laughs> 
don't tip next time. See what happens. You know, any of those, you know, <laughs> lingering time, bitch, and your furniture <laughs> would get moved around. <laughs> All right. Something creepy might happen. She was just trying to creep out the tenants to keep them on point, you know? That's a good way to do it. Yeah. I like I it. Think. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with fucking with people's minds. There you go. This poor thing, Elise, though, she had a sad past. Her son was hit and killed by a truck right outside of the Dakota. Man. Uh, I thought this place was like miles and miles away from anything happening. What was he out doing? This was, you know, by the 1930s, things had evolved. The city had built up around it. So, yes, it had gotten busier around there. And he had died right in front of the building. And a lot of people claim, though, that Elise didn't die in the building or anything. But they claim a part of her must have died that day when her son was killed. And that is what created the crying lady. So it's kind of like believed to be are looked at as a residual haunting and it's just that imprint that she left behind when she was mourning her son i can see that sure absolutely i can see that the dakota also was a prominent filming location for rosemary's baby oh i love that movie i know and we've mentioned it a few times it just keeps coming up however after the filming had wrapped you know several people involved with the production of this film started experiencing very odd events Mm. for example composer christophe comega fell into a coma in an eerie coincidence that mirrored the doctor's character in the movie rosemary's baby there are various accounts of what happened to christophe but many believe that he was pushed off like a steep slope at a party by a writer uh, named Merrick Lasgo. Mm. After that, he was transported to Poland, and then he died because he never actually regained consciousness. Someone was jealous, and they fucked that poor boy up. Yeah, yeah. But there were all the there was other people that said like, oh, he fell during a hike, and I forget what the a car accident or something. It's like people making up all these excuses. It uh-huh. must have been all the cover ups before yeah. they like realized, no, this motherfucker had a temper and pushed him at a party. Right. You know. Then there was producer William Castle. He had issues after the shooting of Rosemary's Baby. It doesn't sound very serious. He just, I mean, it was, it was a severe enough case for him to end up in the hospital, but it was just kidney stones. So after, <laughs> you know, I know they're horrible, but I mean, it sounds like a pretty typical health issue and not yeah. very odd at all. However, yes. Castle himself was the one that reported to people that while in the hospital, he had vivid hallucinations that were like nightmares about the movie. Mm. It was a pretty scary movie for its time. Yeah. That's a pretty loud thunder. Let's let that one roll. <laughs> this is great. I love that you're talking about Rosemary's Baby and all that thunder is happening. It's just so epic. <laughs> the most infamous kind of tragedy that stems from Rosemary's Baby or from the connection with the Dakota is that just over a year after the movie was released, director Roman Polanski's mm-hmm. pregnant wife, Sharon Tate, was murdered by members of the Manson family. I, I told you in a past podcast, I'm, I'm actually listening to uh, Helter Skelter right now on audio. So as soon as you said uh, Roman Polanski, I was ready to p- hit pause on yeah. this podcast because I've already had my like, whoo. Listen, and we can't go into it. And with this, like while I was researching the Dakota, mm-hmm. the apartment complex, that's obviously most notably famous from its connection with John Lennon's death, there was this whole spiral of a website that was talking about Rosemary's baby and Roman Polanski and John Lennon. And it's all helter skelter and it's all connected. And I was like, hold the fuck up. I think you're just trying to take a bunch of popular famous names and, and make a conspiracy out of it. So I didn't go there, but yeah, there's a whole thing even with John Lennon's death connected yeah. Just because they were in this same place together at one point in time, you know? Yeah. I know. People do that shit. That's like how many famous names can I say in one sitting to get people's attention? Right. It's definitely easy uh, when this famous person, this celebrity, yeah. was also very political. Yeah. So, I mean, he was very outspoken with his beliefs and, and it did make a political impact. 
And so it is easy to draw him into that stuff. Talking about John Lennon, not yeah, like yeah. Roman Polanski. Um, but <laughs> what do you know about him that I don't know? No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, like he, he put a target on his own back, not to say at all that he deserved what he got. He's no. a beautiful person. And, and freedom of speech is so important in, in the right contents. I should say that because, you know, some of these people that spot out some crazy bullshit. <laughs> then, right. <laughs> <laughs> really, I'm not going to say that and it, freedom of speech is what it is. It's freedom of speech. But, um, you know, I said it in the other podcast that I was watching Mindhunter <laughs> and this is not ruining it for you, but they arrest somebody who's a racist asshole. Oh, yeah. OK. And he says, I can I can hate who I want. That's the freedom of this. And I can mm-hmm. it's freedom of speech. I can say what I want. You know, you can call people horrible names and stuff like that. So when so when you take freedom of speech to that level, it's like, stop that. That's rude. Yeah. Bullshit. <laughs> exactly. That's but abusing the rights. About injustices in the world or whatever, then that's great. Yeah. Yeah, it gets abused. Um, back to this story. So these events with Rosemary's Baby and what happened after the production of that movie led people to believe that the Dakota was cursed and had cursed the crew and the entire movie itself. Yeah. But these stories are just a few of a long list of tragedy and haunting tales from the Dakota. This building seems to have been plagued kind of from the very beginning. Edward Clark, who was the founder of the Dakota, spent a million dollars and years of his life to create his dream of luxury accommodations in this serene setting of New York City. But sadly, Clark never got to see his dream come true. In 1882, two years before the building was completed, Clark passed away. Now, he was 70 years old. And it was 1882. Yeah. So it is believed that he died of natural causes. And that's fair. Sure. But I think Mr. Clark still had issues with leaving before seeing his project completed. An employee, John Painter, was an electrician working on the Dakota in the late 1930s. And while working on a wiring issue within the building, John would often take pieces home with him to try to figure them out. I'm assuming the system was old and outdated, and that's why John didn't know what he was looking at. Or John was a, air quote, proclaimed electrician, and he just... Like, oh shit! Friend of a friend of somebody's cousin who needed uh, a job. I don't really know why he's fucking taking shit home, wires, and being like, "What is this shit?" But he was doing that. Research. And somebody didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> somebody didn't like what he was doing because one night while John was working in the basement at the Dakota, there was a short man that appeared out of the shadows. Well, how short are we talking? Because this could get really creepy really quick. <laughs> I mean, that... did he walk up to like try to get something in the microwave and he's just like, Sam, I'm too short. Can you please? <laughs> no. Where did the microwave come from in the 1930s? <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were talking about luxurious hotels. <laughs> how long have microwaves <laughs> existed? I don't know. <laughs> No, he he was he just ex- described him as short. He thought he was a real man. He just okay. thought it was odd how he popped up out of the darkness like that. Yeah. But at first he's like, "Oh, hey, dude." And he said he's short. He wore a frocked coat and a winged collar, and he had small steel rimmed glasses. He had a large nose and a well-kept beard. So that's how he described him like to a T. And he thought he was talking to like a real person. However, this short man didn't really say anything to John. He just walked up to him and angrily glared at him. He's like, I don't believe you're actually a certified electrician. (laughs) (laughs) Who let you in here? So according to John, this lasted for a few minutes, this angrily glare, and then a few few minutes, minutes. you know, it always films like a lifetime and it was actually probably like seconds, but it's very true. So yeah, because I don't think I'd be able to stand around while someone's like angrily glaring at me. I'd be like, okay, fine. You win. Oh, I'm not going to freeze up. (laughs) The staring contest. No, I'm like, gotta go. It's kind of like if a bear's after you, though, you're not going to turn around and run. So uh, a few minutes later, however, the short man just vanished. And that's when John knew he wasn't dealing with a real person. So he's angrily glaring at him for minutes and then he disappears. Yep. He doesn't walk away. He just like, it's gone. Interesting. John had four more run-ins 
You like how I show you my whole hand? Yeah, but it's five. Of four. <laughs> 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 One to grow on. Sorry about that. So he had four more run-ins with this short man ghost while working at the Dakota, but never figured out who oh. he was. But when he explained him to other employees, they said, wow, that sounds a lot like the description and the photographs that we have hanging up around the building of Edward Clark. That's And I looked him up. That's what Edward Clark fucking looks like. He's got the little rimmed glasses, a big nose, and a big old beard. So there's no way that this guy was down there, like, drunk and just remembering? No, there definitely is. <laughs> <laughs> if there's pictures hanging up, I mean, it could be suggestive. Yes. He could have shocked himself. Oh, and been out of his damn. Mind. Like, he, that totally could have happened. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And that is the only sighting supposedly oh. of Mr. Clark in the building is by this John Painter in the basement. Okay. Nowhere else. But he's not the only spirit that employees of the Dakota have seen. Renovation workers reported spectral activity oh, oh. in the 1960s. I bet they saw some spectral <laughs> activity in the 60s. <laughs> oh, yeah. Shit. <laughs> it might contribute to what I'm about to tell you is too. <laughs> so they claim that they saw a ghost of a little girl with blonde hair that hung out in the hallways. According to the witness, the paranormal figure wears a yellow taffeta dress that nearly matches her blonde hair. She also wears white stockings and black leather shoes with silver buckles. I mean, they were oh. really picking up on every aspect of her outfit. Also seen bouncing a red ball down the hallway and often enters and exits through closets. Why is that shocking? <laughs> uh, you know, it's one of those situations where like um, a spirit recognizes that this is the way through hallways, doorways, uh, stairwells, though buildings have been rearranged. So it doesn't quite line up the way the spirit would Remember you know, enter and exit. Yeah. But there's also this case in Iowa of all fucking places um, where this kid was mur like, mm, murdered in a closet. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So yeah. that's what I was thinking. Oh, I was just like, why the fuck are there closets in the hallway? <laughs> <laughs> it's an apartment building. How many? And then I think, oh, there's a cleaning closet. And yeah, I work, I watched that episode of American Horror Story where that that was a hotel, though. I mean, like, I don't know. I was just like, why are there closets in the hallway? That was what was bothering me the most. Hmm. You know, like Harry Potter. Uh, they, it was kind of in the hallway, right? But it turned out to be like his room uh, under the <laughs> stairs. And in The Conjuring, there's one in the hallway also under the stairs. And then there's just some ghost that likes to clap at folks and push you down the stairs. So. But those are in houses. I'm saying these yeah, employees, hotel? these renovation workers, it's not a hotel even. It's an apartment complex. So do apartment complexes like these have hallway closets where I guess they keep the vacuum to vacuum the carpet down that hallway? I mean, I can do some research for you. There's an apartment complex right across the street. That, please. I can walk yes. right over there and just wander the halls and just like try on doors that don't have numbers. A closet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was looking for the closet. My bad. Sorry. <laughs> I was just super interested in that, which is a stupid note to be hung up on. But I just was. That's weird. I guess I've never been in fancy apartment complexes like this. Well, the ones near me aren't quite fancy. So maybe it only works for fancy apartment. Maybe. Complexes. Yeah. Okay. When uh, painters first saw the young girl, she looked at them and proclaimed she spoke to them. She said, it's my birthday. Oh, and then she disappeared down the hallway. With her Aww. red ball into a closet. That's so cute. Yeah. After that, though, it was said that a painter died when he <laughs> fell from a scaffolding and fell down the stairs. He not only fell off of the scaffolding, but then he tumbled down a stairwell as well. So from that point on, everybody thought the little girl in the yellow dress was a bad omen and meant yeah. death. She's the mothman in this story, basically. You see that bitch, you... Get the fuck out of this You're town. Like, mm, never mind. Don't <laughs> no. see you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't give a fuck what birthday it is. I gotta go. Don't pay attention to her. <laughs> then there's the spirits that are physically trying to kill people. So the little girl, oh. I mean, like you said, it was the 60s when that painter fell off that scaffolding. He mm -hmm. could have been on some shit. But nope, there are spirits at the Dakota that are physically fucking attacking people. Wow. Joe Mielsinger. Oh. 
That's my best effort. That's a tough one. Considered the greatest set designer of the golden age of Broadway. Oh, you don't know Joe Mielsinger? (laughs) I know. (laughs) You've heard of him before. No. He lived at the Dakota for years, and he died on March 15th, 1976, just outside the doors of the Dakota. He died in a taxi cab. And, And that's all that it says. And he was 75 years old, or actually this was four days. That means he's a Pisces, by the way. Um, it was four days before his 75th birthday. So it didn't exactly say why he passed away or anything. But hmm. in the weeks following Mielsinger's death, workers at the Dakota experienced items being thrown around the basement by unseen forces. Man, why are they in the basement? I mean, that just seems like the one place I wouldn't want to be. If you're trying to just vent anger and you don't want to break anything valuable, okay, fine, in the basement you go. I guess Mielsinger didn't have his ghost, didn't have a key to everybody's apartment. So it's the only free space in the building. That's cute. So at least he's being respectful of other people's places. Yeah, I didn't leave this in here, and I don't know when they lived there, but like Joe Namath lived here. And Lauren Bacall and uh, who was the other one? Uh, Boris Karloff. So I don't know if they live there at the same time. And he was like, well, I'm not going to bother them. <laughs> They're very busy. Huh. But uh, yeah, he just went to the a free space that had shit he can throw around. And that's the basement, apparently. That's interesting. It sounds like kind of a crabby child that needs a nap, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so Wilbert Ross, a tenant of the building, was called into the basement. I'm going to guess that Wilbert is a big dude because he just lives there. And a porter, which is someone who carries your luggage and things or whatever, uh, called Wilbert down into the basement to help him oh. after the porter had witnessed a shovel flying off of the wall and landing in the middle of the room. Damn. Like 20 feet away from where it was. It landed in the middle of the room. A shovel could kill somebody. Oh, exactly. It gets worse. As Wilbert stands there, he saw himself a large iron bar, which also like, why is there? I mean, Harry get hung up on small things. Why the fuck do you have a large iron bar in the what? What is that for? They have all these weapons in the basement. I mean, that's why the Blair <laughs> like Witch was there. Chamber. Like, yeah. What the fuck is going this is on? Like, this is the perfect place for me to just, you know, scare the shit yeah. out of or kill everyone. We'll just hang out down here. One or the other. Yeah. <laughs> so Wilbert witnesses this large iron bar just flying off the wall and landing right in front of his feet. Well, at least it landed and in front of his feet. feet. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Never helping out in the basement again. Nope. But he kept his job. They're like, no, Wilbert, we need you down there. He's like, uh-uh. They're like, no, Wilbert, go. No. He said, no. Wilbert lives there. He pay, He He's a oh, tenant. Okay. It okay. was the porter unnamed, the unnamed porter, who had called Wilbert down there. Oh, oh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. But still, Wilbert was like, nah, motherfucker, that ain't my problem. So he didn't go down there again. It's no not shit. bothering me in my apartment. It's not like he has to go down there to do laundry or anything. There's no reason he has to go down. So why God, the hell would he? not. This is an old building, though. So, I mean, like, I hope they don't have shared laundry. It's one of those creepy ass, you know, McAllister, you run down, start the laundry, run back up. <laughs> That's kind of like at your place, isn't it? Yes. Sometimes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Every day. If you had a thunderstorm going on and it was dark down there. Yeah. So also, oddly, after Joe Mielsinger died for a brief time, the elevators were being attacked with what seemed to be a knife. Employees would find giant slashes through the paneled walls within the elevators. Every week, the panels would be replaced, only to be slashed up a few days later. Hmm. Tenants began to claim the attack was brought on by the Phantom of the Dakota or the Mad Slasher. They're thinking of, like, cute names. But as it continued, they got increasingly concerned and started blaming one another for it. So they actually like said that the building had to make some kind of enforcement to figure out what the fuck was going on and put up some surveillance and see who's fucking with the elevators. Oh shit. They caught no evidence of this shit happening. We're talking about surveillance in the seventies. Yeah. It's shitty. Probably. 
but yes. <laughs> those are those big ass cameras. They didn't have even like the spy cameras at that point. They're like, it's in your face. You have to share the elevator with the camera. I mean, let's just think about this. I think it's some kind of thing that they put up in like the hallway to, you know, put it on the elevator. Who's going in there that might look like they've got a knife in their hand and they're <laughs> mad. <laughs> I don't know. Right. But they still couldn't figure out if anyone was doing this. They didn't witness anybody looking crazy getting on the elevators. Huh. Get this, though. Coincidentally, the elevator's interior was designed by Mielzinger before his death. Oh, that's interesting. That, um, I'm sorry. I just assumed it was going to be somebody that stabbed a whole bunch of people based off of the stabbing in the <laughs> elevator. <laughs> no, it is just one pissed off set designer. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I don't get it. He was 75 years old, but he seemed to take his death super hard. Yeah. He is throwing fits in the basement. He's fucking up the elevator that he designed. He's so upset. And it doesn't stop there either. Oh, he's got to be trying to tell somebody something. They're not listening. Something. What if he thinks that his death wasn't natural, you know? This was 76. I mean, to live to 75, that's still kind of young, right? Ish. I think so. So as this was all going on, tenants and the employees were also finding odd piles of shredded paper in the halls of the ninth floor. Now, they didn't say whether the connection, like Mielsinger had any connection to the ninth floor, but they were fi finding piles of shredded paper in a fashion that suggested that somebody was looking to start a mm. fire. Somebody's fucking upset about this. Yeah. It was odd. I looked it up like on his Wikipedia page and plus where I got. <gasps> he's got a Wikipedia page stuff. too. He does. He's that big that he's got a wiki, his own Wikipedia page. Dang. Like he was the shit yeah. in what he did. But it simply said he died in a New York cab. It didn't say he choked on something. It yeah. didn't say he had a cardiac arrest. Nothing. He just right in front of his home. Bam. Wow. Like son of Sam. You know, you don't know it. That wasn't the right time. Ooh. Right. I, Ooh. Ooh. It wasn't. Ah. <laughs> it wasn't the right mo or anything, but it just was. No, that's not right at all. But I'm just saying they never really said how he even died. I'm sure you could find it. Maybe I just I just didn't dig that deep. But there was a lot of really scary, pissy things happening in this apartment complex after this man's death. Mm. And it reached a boiling point with all this activity when a can of paint fell from the roof into the courtyard, just barely missing a tenant. The strangest part of all this is that there was no painting or remodeling going on at the time. Right. There was no fucking reason for that can of paint to be on the roof. Damn. Why was that paint up there, man? So you think, okay, somebody Ooh, from a, a past renovation job left it up there. But who the fuck knocked it off? I know birds are big, but not. they're not dactyls. What the fuck? Okay. So let me ask you this. Could they tell after this uh, can of paint had fallen and hit, like, how full it was? Was it, like, a full can? Was it half a can of paint? Like, the weight. How easy would it have been to knock something like this off of the ledge? You know, they left that part of the story out. So what if it was an empty can and just a strong wind blew it off? Maybe they're just exaggerating the story, like, <laughs> this is a total unrelated story nobody was going to die from this but we were inside a little like food court one time and this person that was sweeping dropped their like the handle of the broom just fell out of their hands and it hit our table and it hit it so unexpectedly that we were all like what the fuck and like looked up and this person was horrified I guess we had the shittiest looks on our face. We're the meanest fucking family in the world because we must have looked at this. It was just a broom handle and it just caught us off guard. And none of us was like, how dare you? But obviously our faces said that because this person was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. What can I do for you? Oh. So, I mean, like this empty can of paint it could have been empty and it could have fell and this tenant was like oh, i could have died oh yeah and maybe it wasn't even that big of a deal but it was a full can of paint they could have been like fucking cracked their skull uh, yes. yeah no shit well that's what i was wondering like if there was a measurable amount of paint i didn't know you know if they had it said didn't that. say so that would be a test for Mythbusters mm. if that show still exists it does not the same guys but oh that's i know we should do it then 
<gasps> I would love to be a Mythbuster. Let's go to a tall building and throw an empty can <laughs> and a full can off. But back to this story. The most recent documentation of paranormal events at the Dakota came from the Weinsteins. Oh. According to Frederick, there's lots of Weinstein. Oh, so don't okay. like don't think of the the bad. I one, was you know? I was like pen and not, paper. Okay, no, not him. Oh. Anyways, according to Frederick and Susanna Weinstein, their apartment is just full of crazy paranormal activity. Oh, it started with sounds of footsteps in their dining room, as if someone was frantically pacing back and forth. You know, waiting for it, their dinner. <laughs> 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 but this pacing spirit seems to have something against Frederick, though. Uh-oh. He has found himself repeatedly injured within the dining room. Oh, no. Chairs have been pulled out from underneath him. That's fucked up. I hate that. He has been pushed by unseen forces. And on multiple occasions, it seems as if the rug has been pulled out from underneath his feet. This poor guy. What if Frederick's just a drinker? <laughs> yep. I mean, I might think that this is so strange. I'm always falling down at the dinner table. Mm. Gulp, gulp, gulp. <laughs> <You know? laughs> no, they're kind of seem to be into this activity. So I'm going to believe Frederick when he says these things are happening to him because they're paying a lot of attention to it because never mind all the physical abuse Frederick's been through. He claims that the creepiest event happened when he and his kids were goofing with a Ouija style game that uses lettered tiles instead of a board and a planchette, which sounds to me like a lot like Scrabble. It does sound like my Scrabble. <laughs> They said a Ouija style game. So I don't I don't know what that is, but I'm like, next investigation, we're taking a Scrabble board with us. <laughs> During this game, the spirit messages suggested that the Weinsteins were in contact with the ghost of the little girl, the young girl in the yellow dress or demon or whatever she might be. <laughs> I'm just saying, yeah, because you might die after you see her. Oh. Um, when the game was done, Frederick put away all the pieces. He stacked all the letter tiles up and put it on a bookshelf. But days later, Frederick found two of the letter tiles in the pockets of his suit. Oh. And then he came across a third one in his eyeglass case. Oh, that's creepy. How the fuck did that get in there? Well, and I'd like to know, are they spelling something? Oh, yeah. Well, kind of. So the tiles together said, I see you. Mm, or koi. Or icky. <laughs> right. You can, you can play that game where it's like, <laughs> how many words can I come up with? Look, when you first said that he had two letters in his coat pocket, I was like, was it F-U? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be good. Mm, I see you. Do you know what like order he found him in? Did he get the you last in his eyeglasses case? They imply that that's the order that he got them. Ooh, yet. that's horror so. movie stuff. That's creepy. Yeah. So who and what truly haunts the Dakota remains a mystery to this day, mm. as no paranormal investigators that I am aware of have investigated this building. Oh, it's time. Right? <laughs> Virgin territory. Nope. So there's a little bit of issue since it is a apartment complex. Oh. The Dakota was designated a New York City landmark in 1969. The building was added to the National Registration of Historic Places in 1972 and was designated as a National Historic Landmark because this place just fucking loves titles and needs some more of them in 1976. The Dakota still operates to this day as a fancy fucking apartment complex Ooh. for the rich mm -hmm. as it cost two million to twenty million dollars <sighs> for an apartment in this building, just depending on the size of the condo. Well damn. I guess I will never be living in this place. Right. That is to buy in full for your condo, but you are on a board, so you buy to live in the building. Okay. Is the way it is, mm -hmm. but you have your own deed to an individual floor plan, which is your apartment. That sucks. But 
you have like your part, uh, you have to get approved by a board to even move into this place. And they have turned down some big fucking names before. They're actually kind of famously known for turning down some really famous celebrities. Um, fuck those guys. Because here's the thing. You're, you're spending a ton of money to live in a building with a whole bunch of other assholes. You don't know if they're going to be lighting candles and then falling asleep. You're in this building with these people and you're paying bazillions how much did you say it's probably not bazillions it's a lot of money 20 million it might as well be bazillions for me because it's nothing i will ever have that's crazy (laughs) this is for the rich of the rich and i don't have that mindset so that's why it's bonkers to me but at the same time i hate living in um, any kind of a facility that is connected to other residents because i don't know what the fuck they're doing next to me there could be a meth lab in the apartment over from me and just because these are the richest of the rich don't mean that they ain't gonna get a little uh spunky crazy and yeah Yeah. go try some uh, meth creation of their own you (laughs) that's i love how you they're just putting them as meth dealers instead of being like loud or drunk or smoking weed or something like that no but with since you mention it about the fire and all of that i didn't put this in the story but i know i read it the Dakota at one point in time, which I can't see actually still existing these days with all the fire codes and whatnot that they would put on buildings. But when it was originally built and for a long time, it did not have fire escapes. Oh, apparently the way that it was built, uh, it made a protection between each layer of the floors that a fire couldn't escape to the next floor. So I'm just saying it's possibly pretty sound oh, and I fireproof, oh. though I do believe they had to. I don't know for a fact, but they had to have put in fire escapes since then. Yeah. I cannot see somebody allowing that like to still exist. Well, but maybe they do get away with it. Maybe they got it grandfathered in. Maybe the way that they did their, uh, built, you know, built their building, it's like, yeah, actually that works. I mean, they put some layer of like, I want to say mud, but I know that can't be right. Like I said, I didn't put it in the story, but I know I read it. And I was like, that can't be true. Like, that can't be what happens now. Right. There's no way somebody's going to, like, move into a building that doesn't have an escape fire route. Seat. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, mm-hmm. but So just. I don't think you have to worry about the fires, all I'm saying, okay. or possibly even hearing your neighbors. It sounds like it's pretty solid and soundproof. I would hope know, so. Minus the ghost. But no matter what, um, not many apartments come available in this building. Mm-hmm. So it's unlikely that you'll ever get an opportunity to <laughs> buy one in the first place. <laughs> I mean, not even having to like, hold on a second. Let me find a rental application. I don't have the funds <laughs> for that shit. <laughs> <laughs> so... Millions still mourn the death of John Lennon and are surely comforted by the thought that his spirit lives on after death. Yeah. Lennon himself firmly believed in the afterlife. He was quoted as saying, I am an optimist about eternity. I believe in life after death. I believe that death is not the end, but the beginning. Fifty years ago, on September 26, 1969, the Beatles' 12th official album, Abbey Road was released. This would have been their last recorded album together. Hmm. On October 4th, it hit the UK charts at number one and stayed there for 11 weeks before the Rolling Stones. Let It Bleed knocked them to number two. But just actually a week after that, the Rolling Stones was knocked down and the Beatles took first again. And then they stayed on the charts for like 92 weeks in total. Well, I like that fight. I'm a big Rolling Stones <laughs> fan as well. So that works for it me. It seems like everybody was like, oh, my God, the Rolling Stones put out a new album. And then they were, oh, no, actually, that, that Beatles album was yeah, better. Yeah, pretty cool. Um, <laughs> so it went back to being number one. But uh, that is an amazing album. And that was about 50 years ago, pretty much in around this time. Wow. You know, that's just like as long as our podcast has been on air. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe the coincidence. (laughs) 50 seasons. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. crazy. Uh, So just for funsies, I'm going to send you this photo. Oh. So one psychic, Christina Hamlet, claims to have captured the image not only of John, but of George Harris as well, through a very unique process. Her technique called instrumental transcommunication summons spirits to create images 
In reflective surfaces such as water, steam, and Christina's preference, silver origami paper. During this process, Christine records it on her camera by taking photographs. Okay. Such as the odd one that I sent you. What? Wow. Is that like a mouth and a nose? She lays out a sheet of silver origami paper and then she says, hey, spirits. She doesn't even call out a certain spirit. She just says, hey, anybody Ooh. that wants to communicate, show yourself. And apparently John and George Harris was just like, oh, me, oh, me, oh, oh both of us. Wow. And just popped up in her I photo. Now, listen, this makes me think of all those people that find Jesus in their piece of toast. <gasps> you know, <laughs> I, I love the toaster lady. That's like the best thing. <laughs> that is hilarious. That demon toaster. <laughs> yes. That's a hilarious thing circling out there. Oh. But you know, there's always people that are like finding faces in toast anything. and whatnot, anything. And so, I mean, this could just very well be that. Okay. We'll put this out there for people to see. I see two noses, two mouths, uh, three eyes, and an ear. So I can see where this lady's coming from, but she's also, she's using something that's reflective in her process too. Silver origami. I mean, I, I don't know, but origami is something that you fold up. Yeah. Right. To make birds right. or mean, cranes, whatever. Yeah, I think it's just a certain type of paper, but yeah. It's, I mean. I'd like her to video record this process so that I yeah. can see her not tampering with anything before I would believe it. But in all the stories of the Dakota this is the only visual shit I got for you. So that's that's exactly why I'm sharing it is because I was uh, looking to see if John Lennon's spirit is floating around anywhere else. And this is all I got. Well, I mean, that happens with all of the places that we've investigated. Sometimes you come out empty handed, right. but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It's just that same situation where it doesn't always happen on cue. And yeah, for these people, it's an apartment complex, too. So people aren't like out there exploring it. no. It catches them off guard and it's a moment that they experienced, but they have no documentation like the spirit I grew up with. Right. I mean, that was the most powerful paranormal experience for me in my life is that ghost that I lived with. Do I have any proof for you? No. I mean, I fucking was like, leave me alone. I'm trying to get dressed, you fucking creep. Yes. <laughs> now, you've seen two apparitions or is it three since we've been paranormal investigating? Have we caught any of them actually on no. film? No, no, they were fucking there and then they were gone. So it's the most disappointing things that I've ever had to admit to in my life, because it always happens when I'm completely caught off guard. I should be filming in that moment, but I'm doing something else. I have a camera in my hand, but I'm using it as a flashlight. I mean, these are the <laughs> like, seriously, these are the moments that I have to explain to my husband. I've seen something with my own eyes and I have no physical evidence to show you that would back up what I saw. That's the issue with trying to prove Anything. ghosts exist. Right. There is no, there's no such thing. You're never going to do it. You're never going to prove to people that haven't experienced themselves that ghosts exist because it's something you have to see to truly believe. I can tell you stories all day long and they could listen and they're right. like, wow, wow, that's scary. That sounds so freaky. Right. That's crazy. I don't know what I would do. And but they're like, eh, that's for you. That's not for me. That didn't happen until it does, until it happen, does happen to them. Then it takes on a different meaning. So Yeah, it does. And you always hope that at that point in time, they'll come back around and they're like, hey, remember that one time when we were talking? And let's talk some more about that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, you know, like I said earlier, or maybe on another podcast where my husband was describing something he heard coming down the stairs. And I'm like, this is the moment. This is the moment. And it was my fat ass cat. Not the moment. <laughs> I just hope that he experiences something paranormal just once. I just want him to be there in the moment so that he understands that feeling that it's something so special and you're left with so many questions. Why did this happen? What were they trying to tell me? Show me. And you want to know more. And then that spirit never presents itself to you again. Or when it does, it's in a different form, like in your case. Or we can't go back and have that exact same situation happen again, which I kind of hope when we go back to Velisca, it's completely different. I think of it, honestly, I think if it was just like a totally different vibe, I would, I would question myself and be 
being like, well, what the fuck was wrong with me on that night? You know, I'd like to walk in and see that it behaves the same way and be like, yep, I was right. This is what it's I mean, just like when we watched that episode on yeah. Kindred Spirits and they were reporting kind of back the same energies that yeah. we felt and we felt so validated. So I would feel awkward if we were to go back and it would were to behave differently. I mean, I understand that like different energies can just float through at different times. So I would tell myself that to try to be like, well, what happened was real. But, to you know, today it feels totally different. But I mean, if it gave off the same vibe, I'd be like, see, I fucking <laughs> told you all. <laughs> well, with a place like that, we kind of know what to expect, too. So uh, we're expecting something bad to happen. It's not like you can call them on the phone, too, and be like, hey. You going to be at the Bliska Axe Murder House? Yeah, me too. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. Schedule a time for you to get right. wild. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's validating to have somebody to have that experience, especially someone close to you in your in your life. So that, I mean, your husband's such a skeptic that it'd just be awesome when we're always spitting our bullshit right next to him. And he's like, yeah. you bitches are crazy. That he could be like, well, there was this weird time, you know, and that would make him rethink things. It would be he awesome. would never admit to it. Um, but <laughs> I'd know if he just became silent on the whole matter. I'd know. But going back to this lady and her origami, I mean, it is interesting. She's using a different form, a different technique to try and reach out and connect with the spirits there. And she caught something that's of interest. And I appreciate that you sent that to me because I don't see the full picture. I, I don't know if she did or not, but I'd like to see a like a completely zoomed out version of the picture, too. But I don't know if her camera was even set up to do that shit. You know, it might have been focusing on one uh, special area. I've seen that on Instagram, too, where people do a lot of smoke like fire scrying and yeah. you see all kinds of faces in that. Look, I've never stared at smoke that hard uh, to be 100% honest with you. My allergies won't let me sit and by a fire for that long. It's cool and all. I like to be warm, but I have to back up and the further you get, you don't see shit appearing in the smoke, but some of the things that they've put on Instagram, it, well, it looks like demon faces. Then again, I mean, zoom out and give me the whole picture, too. I, d I don't really know what she's looking at. There's a towel that I used to have yeah. hanging up in my bathroom. And if you sat there and stared at it long enough, it looked like faces. You know? <laughs> I don't have that towel anymore. One of the first ghosts that I ever saw, I was like, is that a pile of clothes? I know, right? But I, I swear to you, Oof. I am pretty certain it was a ghost. But when you saw it like lift up and move away and kind of evaporate. No. So it was sitting in a chair. It was the day that we had went to the funeral for our elderly neighbor who passed away from cancer. And she had she had no hair like at the end. And whatever was sitting in this chair had it was bald. It didn't have any hair. I mean, like. Yeah, we we left a lot of clothes piled up around places, huh. but could they make that smooth, you know, where you can tell it's a bald head? I don't know. I mean, I was also like six or seven year old child. I mean, maybe I was imagining things. It's not the same as the male ghost that I grew up with that I know repeatedly I had visits from. This was the only time I, I mean, maybe saw her the night of her funeral. But it was just that one thing, like a goodbye type ghost, yeah. you know, like a, a just a goodbye afterwards because we were very close to her. She was very nice and she was always, I mean, I think her family must have lived like a ways. We were little kids right next door. So she catered to us and cookies and, Aww. you know, just attention and stuff like that. She was a really cool lady. And like I said, it could have been a pile of clothes, but I asked my sister to look at it and she was like, yep, nope. <laughs> I mean, she looked. But then she came back and was like, yep, nope, that's a ghost. That's fine. Let's go to sleep. Well, and it could have been that she was checking in on you, not not your sister, but the uh, the lady that had passed away. You said it, this happened right after she had passed away and you guys were relatively close, which is very intriguing. It wasn't, you know, until I started exploring the paranormal with you when I finally got to see something for myself. That's so interesting because it's kind of shut down for me in the visual aspect. I can hear and I can sense, but I've yet to see a spirit since the ghost that I grew up with, the male ghost. And I was 18 when I moved out of the house and I haven't seen a ghost since then or whatever. I was actually younger, probably the last time that I saw him. And 
in all our explorations, nothing. I mean, I've sensed them. I know they're there. I hear them, but I've never visually seen them. And then you are the one that are like, hey, there's a ghost. <laughs> and I'm like, where? Right. When I'm screaming. <laughs> yeah. I thought about that not too long ago. It's really interesting to me how, like, your other senses are more in tune. Like, you seem to have, like, a sixth sense. Like, you cringe. You feel something. Like, when we were uh, James Eldridge, you said you felt like there was something there. You sensed it. And you pushed to get past me to get the fuck out of there. And I'm like, well, what's going on? You're like, oh, nothing, nothing. Everything's cool. You go in there. <laughs> it's Just check it out. Just hang out in there for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you seem fine. You just stay with it. <laughs> I gotta go. It hates me. I gotta go. But yes. Yeah, it's really, it's weird though. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what it is and what's changed, but I I feel like I'm trying to be open. I went and had my tarot cards read a few weeks ago. And when you start the tarot, the reading with the lady, We'll call her a medium. I don't really remember what she called herself. Medium, psychic, yeah. whatever. Just tarot card reader. I'm not sure. Uh, but she holds your hand. She actually reads your palm oh. and does your tarot card. But she like holds hands with you, basically. And she says a blessing, we'll say, like opening. And it was so funny because I watched her do this with another person. And she just said her thing. And then she gave this person a reading. And it was a very positive reading. And here I am, someone who totally right. believes and loves all of this stuff. She takes my hands and she starts her blessing and she goes, oh no, honey, open up. <laughs> and I was like, what the fuck? I'm right here. You know, I'm not trying to put up this wall and I'm not trying to be closed minded at all. I believe in, I want this stuff. Please, please read my palms, read my tarot cards, give me some life direction. And uh, apparently she felt some kind of resistance for me or either every other person she says that to. I don't know. But I know how we are when we paranormal investigate. You know, we're so open, but we're also very controlled. And so I thought it was something like that. I'm like, please, yes, let's open up the energy, but also don't fucking get in my business. <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't know what it is. It's so strange. So I, I feel like as an adult, I might have put up that visual wall where I don't see it because it scared me so much as a kid. Oh. But it sucks because I am like, I'm in it to win it. Let's do this. Yeah. So I'm jealous of you and your sighting. It's weird. It's weird because like I, I went in this with an open mind, just interested in exploring the paranormal. My, my mom had experiences that she would talk to me about. And I was like, wow, like wide eyed, like that's crazy this happened and this happened and this happened because I had like a thousand questions to follow up with it and she, I mean she was very open to me about every experience that she had and I was just like ah, I mean I can't believe that happened that's just so like a movie and nothing ever ever happened to me as a child it, it didn't happen until we went out exploring the paranormal and yep I've seen some things <laughs> that's, that's probably the best way to describe it <laughs> I have seen some things and probably one of the best pictures that I've ever taken was of something that I've not seen was when we were at the James Eldridge farm homestead, I, I, whatever. But it was that thing that was out there in the yard that looked like it was trying to block a lady from taking her photos. It was something that was out there that wasn't actually there. Man, that was that was such a cool location. Oh, the whole thing. Even the belt breaking off. <laughs> That's why I'm on this diet. Listen, I cannot wait until you guys listening to us help us take this podcast to the next level so that we can fucking just be on the road and revisit these locations. Yeah, I'm talking about you just supporting my dreams, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but we can talk Am about I it. Am I not entertaining you? Right. I mean, come on. What else do you want? <laughs> Seriously. For you guys, I know we kind of went off on a tangent that this was the podcast wasn't about us, but we made it about us. We just had some experiences and, and we really questioned this stuff. And so that was us just kind of really working through our thoughts of what inspired us to get into paranormal investigating together and then how it's been for us since we've connected. So if you enjoyed this podcast, please rate and review uh, on any form that you listen to us on like iTunes. I know that you can do it on there and I'm sure you can do it on any other podcast platform or you could just message us on social media. It's C-O-T-N underscore paranormal on Instagram and then just C-O-T-N paranormal on Twitter and Facebook. So you can leave us messages 
messages. You can send us direct messages. You can also email us at creatures of the night paranormal at gmail.com. You can email us just your opinion of the show if you really want to. But what we really are looking for is people to send us their personal stories. I bet we're not going to get anybody that lives in the fucking Dakota. <laughs> apartment complex that'd be great but if you happen to be some millionaire checking out this show <laughs> then by all means share your experiences with us and buy some shit on our shop <laughs> <laughs> like the whole shop everything you know whatever you want custom made uh, just for you <laughs> But uh, you can share any of your paranormal experiences with us because we'd like to make some creature features. That would be our little mini-sode in the middle of the week or once a month, either one. We'll have to see what will work with us. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> you know, we got jobs, too. Anyways, you can... Email us your stories and share those with us and we'll share them here on the podcast or we'll build a whole podcast story around your experiences if they're that extreme. And then, yeah. Please. So, uh, you know, we talked about all these spirits connecting with us and, uh, you know, the experiences that we've had. So if you're having your own and you're concerned about them, and then you can always go to our Etsy shop or it's actually on our website as well, creaturesthenightparanormal.com. You can buy spiritual products to protect yourself against something that might be bothering you or even to enhance your experience if that's what you're trying to do. I mean, because we kind of teeter between both of those. You know, it's kind of like, hey, don't possess us, but also you want to hang out? <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk. Let's have a chat. But calmly, you know, boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. If you're starting to embark on your paranormal journey, then the Spirit Emporium is probably the best place to start uh, because there's everything from protection items uh, to t-shirts because <laughs> <laughs> you can buy t-shirts to support our podcast as well. And thank you so much because when I said you can go shopping for our stuff, I didn't even say what our shop was called. <laughs> It is the Spirit Emporium, so don't look for Creatures of the Night necessarily. Under Etsy, it's just the Spirit Emporium. That's us, too. Mm -hmm. We got so many names. We also got this old-ass yeah. site. It's called I Believe in Ghosts.com, which one day eventually we'll update it again. But if you ever happen upon that site, that's us, too. So... <laughs> We all, all over, over the, the place. place by different aliases, you know, Trish and Tina oh. <laughs> and Chris and Wendy. That's and... right. That's right. But that's all I got for you. So. Oh, my God. Your story was really amazing. I can't believe you were worried at all that that was going to be boring. And by the way, that's not one that I would have even thought to look into. We're always like worried that we're going to be like, she's doing this story. I just know it. And nope, I wouldn't have even looked into that. I think I kind of knew that. And so I was like, yeah, she'll never do this story. <laughs> so, like my husband's a huge Beatles fan. I don't know if you knew that or not. So it, it not should have been that. something on my radar. Yeah, he, that's like, that's his jam for sure. He, he loves the Beatles. He's always been into the more like mellow kind of happier music, whereas I'm Aww. like into death metal and not so much, the, not the happier stuff, the stuff that talks about death. So <laughs> well, w my dad would play the Beatles for us all the time. And so, it, you know, I grew up with it and fortunately my kids are into it as well. So it, it's a, it, I have. I can't tell you how many Beatles songs I have on my Spotify playlist. So it's ridiculous. Anyways, though, we're trying to wrap this up. And again, we don't, don't know, how. know how to do this shit. <laughs> so. <laughs> Help us out. Yeah. So go to our YouTube page where we have a whole video about how you can benefit from helping us figure out how to wrap this shit up because we will just keep talking for the rest of the night, you know, until one of us is ready to throw up or pass out. It's one or the other. <laughs> that doesn't happen regularly. P.S. Just saying. Not the throw no. up part. Pass the it pass out. Up, like sleepy pass out, not like blackout, you know? Anyways. Yeah. So this is the end of the podcast. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's end. how we're going to end it from now on. The end. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Come back again. <laughs>